Good morning, church. It's good to be with you today. And before I get any further, happy Mother's Day to you all out there. I hope this is a, a rich day filled with, uh, uh, with all the ways that you are appreciated. I hope you definitely feel lifted up today. Uh, and I don't have many announcements uh, for the group. Uh, just uh, encourage you to continue to take care of one another, to um, let me or our folks at the church know if there's any needs that, that, that can be met or, or prayer needs, um, and, um, and make those phone calls. Um, whenever somebody pops into your head, it's a, it's a great time to call them, um, uh, especially, uh, especially those that, that might be living alone. Uh, but we'll continue to take care of each other and we'll continue to be church uh, as, um, as we have to find new, new and unique ways to do so. Uh, one of the ways that we continue to be church is by serving others. Uh, and I am uh, uh, encouraged by the incredible show of uh, commitment uh, to this community that the parish has shown uh, in the, the putting together of these snow packets. Um, you can see uh, it is uh, quite an, an assembly, uh, and uh, this is a project with uh, FISH and the public school system, uh, which provides over 8,000 meals a week uh, for folks in need. Uh, and when they run out of food at the cafeterias, uh, they need something to be able to make sure they don't send anyone away hungry. And so that's where these uh, snow packets um, uh, come in. And so we are putting them together. All of the things that, that, that go in them are uh, listed in the weekly email. Um, it is some, some breakfast uh, off offerings, um, uh, some uh, lunch or dinner offerings, uh, and some snacks uh, through the course of the day. But uh, it's a simple uh, pack, and I ordered everything uh, online, um, uh, and it was all delivered, and, and we were able to, uh, to assemble them, so you can do likewise. Uh, also, if you'd like to make a donation, that would be accepted as well. But I would love uh, for it to be uh, a beautiful show of, of, of our commitment to this community. Uh, and it's something that we can do, even uh, as so many things aren't possible now because of the, the pandemic. So, um, And I'll also uh, just remind you to continue uh, to please support the parish uh, as we continue to move through this season. You'll um, see an article in the, in the weekly about um, our finances and... and um, and we're very grateful for all those who've continued to, um, to keep up with their commitments and, and even make a, a deeper commitments. So thank you very, very much. Um, and with that, we begin our worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord, the Lord is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia, alleluia. Hi, St. James. We miss you so much. Hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. We appreciate everything St. James Church and School is doing to keep us connected. Wishing, Wishing all, all the mothers, mothers out there, there a very happy, happy Mother's Day. Day. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, this is the Urban Family, and we like to wish all the mothers a happy Mother's Day. I ask your prayer for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church, especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan and Jennifer, our bishops, Ben and Ted, our clergy. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, especially for Donald, our president, the Congress, and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in the armed forces, their families, and all deployed in harm's way, especially Mark. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison, especially during this season. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially for Karen, Judy, Helen, Carol, Steve, Bonnie, Omni, Steve, Steve, Judy, John, Joan, Kay, Ansel, Tina, Linda, Fred, Kay, Ed, Barbara, K, 
Peter, Marie, and for those whom we now name, either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for all healthcare and emergency workers, those who continue to put themselves at an increased risk to provide essential services and those facing economic insecurity as a result of COVID-19. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal Church and School, our Stephen ministers and their care partners. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died and those whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for the faithful and growing relationship between First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our many blessings, which we now name either silently or aloud. We give thanks for all mothers and those who have been a nurturing and positive influence in our lives. We also pray for those whom this day is met with sadness, loss, or difficulty of any kind. May we know the love of a mother for a child to be a glimpse of the immeasurable love God showers upon each of us. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. From wherever we find ourselves, we offer our prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. During this time, we may know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together in boldness as your church to be signs and agents of your hope, your healing, and your love. We pray this in your name of your Son, in the name of your Son who came and dwelt among us, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Good morning, and welcome to the fifth Sunday of Easter. Today's Gospel is from John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and, in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this week I came across a beautiful essay written by a poet uh, and writer and aspiring professor, and she begins by describing uh, the three-day process of interviewing for a professorship that she deeply, deeply desired, uh, and part of it was justifying one of the classes that she was slated to teach uh, if she was hired, a class on fairy tales. 
And this is her reflection upon finding out that she didn't get that job uh, and returning home amidst the pandemic. In fairy tales, form is your function and function is your form. If you don't spin the straw into gold or inherit the kingdom or devour all the oxen or find the flower or get the professorship, you drop out of the fairy tale and fall over its edge into an endless blank forest where there is no other function for you, no alternative career. The future for the sons who don't inherit the kingdom is banishment. What happens when your skills are no longer needed for the sake of the fairy tale? A great gust comes and carries you away. In fairy tales, the king is the king. If he's dethroned, his bones clatter into a heap and vanish. Loosen the seams of the stepmother and reach in. Nothing but stepmother inside. Even when the princess is cinders and ash, she is entirely princess. I send my sons on a scavenger hunt because it's day 58 of homeschooling and I'm out of ideas. I give them a checklist, a rock, soil, a berry, something soft, a red leaf, a brown leaf, something alive, something dead. An example of erosion, something that looks happy, a dead branch on a living tree. They come back with two canvas totes filled with nature. I can't pinpoint what this lesson is exactly. Something about identification and possession something about buying time. As I empty the bags and touch the moss and the leaves and the twigs and the berries and a robin blue eggshell, I consider how much we depend on useless arbitrary tasks to prove ourselves. I consider how much we depend on these tasks so that we can say at the very end, we succeeded. Tomorrow on day 59, I will ask my sons to find me an acre of land between the salt water and the sea strand. Plow it with a lamb's horn, sow it all over with one peppercorn, reap it with a sickle of leather, and gather it up with a rope made of heather. I will tell them if they perform each one of these tasks perfectly, that they will be rewarded with more tasks. And if they perform each of those tasks perfectly, they will be rewarded with more, until at last they will not be able to tell the difference between their hands and another boy's hands. Over the years, I've applied for hundreds of professorships and even received some interviews. I've wanted a job like this for so long, I barely even know why I want it anymore. I look at my hands and I can't tell if they're mine. Well, today's gospel, that 14th chapter of John, is probably even more than the 23rd Psalm, a standard of our burial service. Almost every funeral, this passage is read. And it's great consolation for those grappling with the loss of a loved one. It's beautiful to think of that place prepared just for them. In the King James Version, that place is described as a mansion. The NRSV that we read more often calls it a dwelling place. The Message Bible just says rooms. I used to think that the King James Version uh, was so much more satisfying, a mansion prepared for you. Thought maybe we should read that in the King James Version like we have that option to do uh, with the 23rd Psalm. It just seems so much more grandiose opens our imagination a little broader about what we might anticipate. And certainly during this pandemic, the idea of being in a mansion seems preferable. There's been divides over uh, how we've uh, been able to hunker down. Uh, it's been said that we're all on the same ocean, uh, but we have different boats. And certainly uh, the idea of a mansion uh, would be preferable to uh, something that we would uh, have to glamorize to call a dwelling place. Uh, but there's still something limiting to all of that. There's still something confining. And what God promises is beyond anything that can confine us, beyond anything we can really even imagine what God promises is beyond that. 
Not that the same yardstick that we measure ourselves with here will be flipped, that those who live in a mansion here will get a dwelling place or a room there and vice versa. What Jesus is promising is not about architecture or place or zip code. And we know this because when Jesus uses that same root word again uh, that we've argued over, whether it's mansion or room or dwelling place, it's about God's Spirit coming and dwelling in us, setting up residence in us, building a mansion inside of us. Jesus is preparing space in the substance of God for us. In the substance of God, we will have an eternal dwelling place in God. That is incredible consolation, but it's not just about life after death. This is about a God who knows us deeply, our truest selves, who is always trying to lift that self out of us. This is about the Easter assurance that in the cross, God emptied God's self for us into us, and in the resurrection, grafts us into him, into resurrected life, into life in God. God doesn't just have a spare room for us that he's willing to open. Jesus isn't just that Uber de that delivers our spirit to the God who parked uh, his spirit in us. Jesus reaches into the whole of our lives and takes us by the hand. Hand that doesn't just look like any hand. God knows and feels our hand like even we are not able to know them. God feels his handiwork. And God feels every experience that connected us to our deepest self, every action that separated us from that truth, and the hands that they have become. God takes all of us and leads us to a place where we can be so fully who we were created to be. Jesus comes and takes us to himself. We are becoming at home in God. And it is freeing in a way that no space could be. His promise invites us to look fully into the promise Jesus made for us in this life. That God is in us, guiding us to be that fullest self. Drawing us towards those things that are of God. Healing, wholeness, a deep peace, and a love and compassion like we find in God. As I think about the mansion, the dwelling place, I also keep going back to the book that our adult ed group is reading, the book, uh, uh, Marcus Borg's book, Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time. And Marcus Borg describes the most basic understanding of God is that God's nature is compassion. His very nature, his very being is compassion. And that compassion comes from the Hebrew word for womb. What a beautiful, what a beautiful description. And on this day, on this Mother's Day, what a beautiful image of God being like a mother carrying a child in her womb. And what a beautiful description for what compassion is and what that dwelling place with God might be like. What a beautiful image of what abiding with God might look like. Being enveloped, nurtured, loved like a growing child inside a mother's womb. Maybe the closest that we can concretize this place. This place that baffles Thomas and Peter. I think the womb hits much closer to our ultimate reality than any description like mansion, however grandiose. Now back to the essay. I text a friend. I can't find bread, flour. She lives in Iowa. I can see the wheat, she says, growing in the field from outside my window. I watch a video of how to harvest wheat. I can't believe I have no machete. I can't believe I've spent so many hours begging universities to hire me that I forgot to learn how to separate the chaff from the wheat and gently grind. If I had a machete, I would use it to cut the mice, and the princess, and the king, and the stepmother, and the castle, and the wolf, and the mother, and the sons, free from their function, so that they could disappear into their own form. 
but also I wanted an office with a number. I wanted a university ID. I wanted access to a fancy library and benefits and students and colleagues and travel money. I wanted the whole stupid kingdom. And then what, says my mother. And then nothing, I say, as I jump off the very top of a fairy tale that has no place for me. I look around. I've landed where I am. And I like it here. To the east, a pile of impossible tasks of my own making. To the west, a mountain of broken crowns I will melt and recast into a machete. It's day 60 of homeschooling. Eli asked me to remind him how to make an Aleph. I take a pencil and I draw it for him very carefully. It's like a branch, I say, with two little twigs attached. You know what, Mama? He says, you'd make a really good teacher. Thank you, I say. And then I show him how to draw a bet. Jesus is not just painting an image of heaven. He has gathered his friends. The night he will be arrested, handed over to death, and put on a cross. He's gathered them in order to prepare them not just for his death or even our dying, but for our living. He is prepping us to take the machete and separate the chaff from the wheat. The identities placed upon us, the way we see ourselves from the self that God made us to be, equips and empowers us to be that person. And when the functions we think give us value or not wane, or come crashing down, as may be the case for so many during these times, we are not cut from the script. God is with us, in us, helping us dust ourselves off, and in the end, taking us by the hand, and giving us a machete to free us from the mansions we seek so that we ourselves Know that we are a mansion worthy of God. This week, I also came across an interview with former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. In it, he was asked about the experience of being in an Easter season that doesn't feel much like Easter. And this is how he responded. Jesus' resurrection isn't something about how we are feeling at any given moment. It's not even about a distant moment in history. It's about something eternally true about God. Easter says that what God did in Jesus on earth, God is always doing through the risen Jesus. Outreach of his hand to forgive, to heal, to call us into communion with one another. That is undefeatable, and it goes on. That is the God that we believe in. The reality that is God continues, unbinding us, recasting broken crowns, taking us by the hand, and dwelling in all of us as we will ultimately dwell in God. Amen. B'nai, Eileen, and I would like to share him 673. The first one ever, oh, ever to know of the birth of Jesus was the maid Mary. Twas Mary the maid of Galilee, and blessed is she, is she who believes, oh,
Remember that life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who traveled away with us. So be quick to be kind, make haste to love. May the blessing of God Almighty, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Our worship is now ended, and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth to proclaim that Christ is risen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Alleluia. 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 On this Mother's Day, I'd like to share two verses of a poem that was written by Betty Stoffel. A mother's prayer is included in her collection entitled Moments of Eternity. These words provided inspiration for me as a young mother, and I believe their message is timeless. Today we celebrate mothers everywhere, and we honor the memory of those who are no longer with us. We're grateful for their dedication and loving examples. A Mother's Prayer. Teach me to balance love between too little and too much, yet to maintain in all of life the outward-going touch. Be thou my courage, strength of heart, my soul's upreaching way, that little feet which follow mine may not be led astray. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day! Day.